thank you so much to you both. Apologies for using Teams. We, I know that the, the, the US prefers Zoom and you're both Zoomers, but uh, hopefully we can manage with, with Team today as well. Um, so it's really fantastic to have you both, Omid Farsad and, and Serafim Batsoglu here with us um, uh, to give our uh, keynote uh, uh, talks of the day at our London Centre for Nanotechnology Nanomedicine Symposium. Uh, so the way I will work uh, is I will introduce Omid uh, first and uh, Omid will give us a background uh, to uh, uh, the translational nanomedicine efforts that they have been uh, doing in his group and his research uh, and moving on towards SEER where um, uh, Seraphim will also take over to give, to talk about the fantastic work that they are doing in this company. So Dr. Omid Frasad is a physician scientist, a serial nanomedicine entrepreneur, company founder, company builder, executive and director across multiple companies and technology platforms. He has founded Seer Inc, which is listed on NASDAQ. In 2017, he's uh, the founder, CEO and chair, and they are advancing a transformative nanoparticle-based Based proteomics platform, which we will hear about today. He's also the executive chairman of Dynamics Special Purpose Corp, which is also listed on NASDAQ, a life sciences blank check company. He previously co-founded several nanomedicine companies, including Bind Therapeutics, which was acquired by Pfizer, Selector Biosciences Inc., which is also listed on NASDAQ, and they are developing a novel antigen-specific tolerance platform for biologics and gene therapy. And he has also founded Tarveda Therapeutics Inc., which is is a oncology biotherapeutics company. From 2004 to 2018, he was professor at Harvard Medical School and directed the Center for Nanomedicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has authored over 180 papers, is the inventor on over 200 issued and pending patents. He has a whole host of awards uh, to his name. Uh, he is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, recipient of the 2016 Ellis Island Medal of Honor, 2014 Golden Door Award um, from the Institute, uh, uh, Interna International Institute of New England uh, for his scientific, societal and economic contributions. Um, he is also listed as the Worldview 100 scientific um, member, in, uh, part of Scientific American in 2015, which recognizes visionaries who shape by technology Technology around the world. Uh, he is also the recipient of the 2013 Rus Nano Prize, which is one of the largest nanotechnology prizes in the world um, for his work on nanomaterial surface modification. Uh, 2012 Ernst & Young New England Entrepreneur of the Year, and he also holds an MA and MD from Boston University and MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, and today, as I mentioned, he will be talking about his translational journey from bench to bench side um, and intro, um, uh, which is followed by Seraphim's talk. Um, Omid, uh, the floor is yours, and I believe that Seraphim will be controlling the slides. Um, uh, we're really, really um, uh, excited to have you here and, and welcome to, to the screen. Nazila, thank you so much. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, Nazila, can I be heard? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so foremost, an incredible thanks to Nazila. Total pleasure for me um, to be here. What what I want to do is, over the course of about twelve slides, just very briefly um, give you my perspective. Really, not not you know at, at the highest level of how we thought about our approach to nanomedicine, and then how did we end in proteomic, which frankly is not even my area of investigation. Um, so foremost, um, most of my career has been to do things that I'm utterly unqualified for. I was initially trained as a molecular biologist, but then I did a postdoc in a chemi lab and MIT in Bob Langer's lab, uh, which is how I started in the field of nanomedicine. And this is going back to my postdoc day in 2001. Um, today, you know, some 20 years later, uh, while this uh, article was published in 2012, today, some 20 years later, I do believe that we are in the dawn of nanomedicine where I think enormous impact is going to come. By the way, when I first showed this article back, I don't know, maybe 2013, 14, um, one of the audience whom we will not name says, Omid, is this the, is this the, you know, the dawn of nanomedicine or is the sun going down on nanomedicine? And which was a funny comment because if you kind of reflect back, Seven, eight years ago, there were a lot of setbacks with various different nanotechnology companies. By the way, I was part of that myself. But, but 
I would say conclusively that today is the dawn of nanomedicine. And why do I say that? We live in the world of pandemic, which would not have been able to develop vaccine against it had it not been because of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology enabled the development of COVID vaccine. If that does not argue that this is the dawn of nanomedicine, I don't know what does. So let's go to the next slide, please, Stefan. So look, our work um, in the lab, I have the privilege of you know, talking about it, but the work was done with everybody else, not myself, um, was always the intent to actually have human impact. And so we were disciplined. There were a lot of great ideas that would come up that we would not pursue um, because we thought that the biggest scarce commodity is time. And we wanted to invest it in a way that the research that we do in the lab had a chance of ultimately impacting human health. And that was our philosophy. It doesn't mean it's the right philosophy. It was our philosophy. Um, so here's the drug binder one four. You can see in that circle on the left, that's a lung nodule that was in this particular patient treated, and then that lung nodule is gone. But I want to tell you how this all came about. Next slide, please. So this is actually the only pieces of work that I physically pipetted for myself. Everything else that I show you is the work of others. Um, I started off initially trying to develop targeted particles, building on the work that Roxandra Graff had done in Bob Langer's lab you know, seven, eight years before I was there, I published a paper um, looking at uh, copolymers of PEG and um, PLA and developing long circulating particles. And the idea was, could we target these? Now, we chose nucleic acid ligands uh, as, a, as a method to target. Um, these were aptomers and we, we developed targeted particles against a particular tumor antigen called the prostate specific membrane antigen and, and showed that targeted particles tend to bind to those cells better than non-targeted particles, and then studied the binding of those under conditions of flow to kind of mimic, if you would, the way these particles behave in uh, circulation, and then put a drug inside the particle. This was a taxane drug, docetaxel, and showed that with an intratumoral injection, we got efficacy. So first of all, why do intratumoral? Well, we did intratumoral because when you would do it IV, uh, you know, a lot of it would have gone to the liver back then. This is back in 2006. So let's go to the next slide. So then um, the idea was, could we then actually find ways to do this that is more likely to translate? So the way we were developing the targeted particles was by conjugating the ligand to the surface of the particle. The challenge was that every time we would go from batch to batch, the conjugation chemistry would work differently. And so we had variability in terms of ligand density, et cetera, on the surface of the particles. And when we think of regulatory agencies, they don't like variability. They're okay if something is good, they're okay if something is bad. But the only thing they ask you is just make the same thing repeatedly. Um, and so if you're consistent in your process and manufacturing, that's actually exactly what they're looking for. And we didn't have that. So the idea was, could we develop linear polymers, these amphiphilic polymers that had the controlled release polymer system um, together with the PEG, and remember that's Roxandra's work, uh, but then also add the ligand. And in this case, this was a, an RNA aptomer that was stabilized to be stable in circulation with a two prime fluor modification. Um, and, and this, you know, 50 some odd base pair aptomers, highly hydrophilic, uh, could be conjugated to the end of this peg and make that polymer very amphiphilic where in the whatever mechanism you use to make the particles, and in this case, this was a nanoprecipitation, that particle would form with the ligand always on the surface because it's trying to kind of get itself, you know, out of the, out of the hydrophobic polymeric core, and it would end up on the surface and we would make a targeted particle without ever needing to do any surface chemistry. Now, the interesting light bulb that went off on our head, and frankly, that light bulb actually resulted in the creation of nearly every subsequent company that came about uh, and really kind of formed the, the underpinning of a lot of our work was, could we now blend different materials together? So, for example, uh, 
you know, blend the, this tri block with a dye block at different ratios, so alter ligand density. But if you would change the peg moiety, uh, you could change the surface hydrophilicity. If you change the terminal functional group on the peg, you can send the surface charge. So really, by just blending biomaterial, we could now create libraries of targeted nanoparticle without ever needing to do post-particle synthesis modification. Next slide, please. So this then formed the basis. Um, uh, this now formed the basis for the launch of the first company. So the company called Bind. We started in 2006. It ended up going public in 13. And I'll tell you about the rest of it in just a minute. So the idea was that you would create um, different functionalized polymer. You would blend them differently. You would create particles that had different physical chemical properties. And you would screen them to see what works. Let's go to the next slide. And so then um, we said, OK, well, the first thing to do is to avoid the liver. So let's screen for long circulation time. So on the left, that's a PK curve um, where the polymer backbone is labeled. And you could see that we could basically create you know, libraries of particles and screen them. And so that's like a lead candidate for particles that actually have a really long circulation in plasma. And they don't really accumulate in a meaningful way in, you know, in liver or in the kidney. Um, and you can see that the plasma concentration remains high even 24 hours out in that case. So now that you have long circulation, because you also have controlled release, and now let's look at the right side, if the particle had you know, very rapid release, um, shown there in purple, for example, you, know, you would release your payload quickly. If it's like moderate release, it would be like the yellow or, or slow to release like the black. So now you have controlled release and you had long circulation and together, they enabled the middle graph, which is essentially a tunable PK. Because remember, the particle is circulating and it's got a long PK. Depending on how fast the drug is being released, that middle uh, graph, that is the drug PK, not the particle PK, you could dial in the desirable PK. And now that you have a desirable PK, um, you, know, you could basically you know, inject the particle IV, not intratumorally, and shown there at 12 hours, you get substantially more drug delivered to the tumor versus um, drug if in, in its soluble solvent-based form, not in the particle. So next slide, please. Okay, so now you have PK in mice, in rats, in monkeys. Repeat dosing wasn't changing the PK, and most of the drug was in the encapsulated form. Now remember, uh, that's a log scale. So if you actually look at the actual concentration, you know, about 95% of the drug in circulation is in the particle. There's about 5% in the free form. And you can see that the human PK, very similar. Next slide, please. So by this time, the drug is in phase one. Here's a patient, Evelyn Sorensen, that unbeknown to us, goes and talks to the press. She was a person um, with metastatic cervical CA, um, refractory to all treatment, she had enrolled in the trial, and in the course of the treatment, she was what is called a complete response, basically undetectable tumors. Um, her and her son actually came to Boston. She lived in Arizona to see me, and it was as if the heaven was handed to me. Sear goes public. Um, and you know everybody who was associated with it, the NCI, the Prostate Cancer Foundation, success has a lot of fathers. Nobody wants to touch a failure. So every human being or organization that had anything to do with this drug is touting it and, and super proud of it, by the way, as I was. So let's go to the next slide. But then the phase two came and the phase two data wasn't great. I mean, it was an okay drug, but it wasn't a great drug. And the question is, well, what the hell happened? And so the unknowns were, well, what were the biomarker correlation? You know, does everybody, because how does a particle get to the tumor? Presumably through this leaky vasculature, maybe some macrophage update. I mean, there's a lot of studies now since done 
uh, in, in the tumor microenvironment that kind of, kind of account for these particles get accumulated. But a lot of that we didn't know. And we didn't know when you give this pristine particle in vivo, well, what happens to that particle? I mean, obviously we know from the work of so many other scientists that very quickly a layer of protein or actually, in fact, many different molecules form on the surface is biomolecular corona that forms on the surface. And how does that impact it? Again, we knew none of that. So let's go forward. So by this time, um, I had discussion with Ralph Weisletter at MGH, and you know Ralph um, was looking at um, iron oxide particles, in this case, pyromoxyl, that actually had been kind of invented um, based on his work, and, and the company called AMAC was developing it. And Ralph says, Omid, uh, and this is the slide to the left, he goes, look, we haven't published this, but take a look at those two patients with renal cell CA. You know, one patient, same size tumor, same type of a disease. In the one patient, you get a homogeneous update of Fermox top. In the other, you get heterogeneous update. Same tumor size, same tumor types, totally different pattern of update. Um, and, and then unknown to us, uh, there was another company that was kind of working on this and subsequently they actually presented their uh, data at the ACR showing that if you gave ferromox, that is the iron oxide particles, and you selected for those patients who had the high update, high uptick, so this is like the above median group, uh, but then you treated each group with your therapeutic particles. So in this case, this was a liposome drug with a chemotherapy inside it. And what they showed was if the ferromox still gets there, likely those are the patients that are gonna to respond to the therapeutic particle because that tumor is amenable to taking up particles. So let's go to the next slide. So by this time we said, okay, so maybe we'll do, and this was a collaboration with Ralph's group, um, uh, you know, uh, Miles Miller and Suresh Gaddy, uh, Miles from Ralph's lab, Suresh from our lab worked on this and they um, they said, okay, well, what if we could give these together? So you give ferromoxidil, you give um, you give the um, the therapeutic particles, um, and then let's let's see what happens. And so when you did that, uh, shown there on the left, um, when you put the drug, a chemotherapy drug, inside of the particle, and you give it, and you group the mice to into the low iron oxide, medium, or high, the group that doesn't take much iron oxide particle also happens to be the one that doesn't get much drug in it at the, in the tumor level. But if you get iron oxide particles, there are more, more, more drug gets there. And then if you get high iron oxide particles, there are a lot of drug gets there. That's shown there on the left. Now, in the middle is if you do the same study, you give the iron oxide particle, but instead of giving the particle, the nanoparticle with the chemotherapy drug, and then you give the drug in its soluble form. When you do that, actually, you don't see much difference. Yes, it is statistically significantly different, but on an absolute level, there isn't much difference. Ironically, if you put the drug in a particle, not in its free form, and you give it to tumors that are not amenable to taking a particle, shown there in the lab, you actually, to those patients, deliver less drug um, per mass of tissue than you do if you gave a drug in a soluble form. And obviously on the right side, not surprised if more drug gets there, the tumor responds. So let's go to the next slide. So it became clear to us that there has to be some patient selection for when you're doing a particle uh, treatment. And then the question was, well, you know, what else do we need to learn uh, if we're really going to make nanoparticle treatments really kind of become, um, you know, to get really the benefit that we want from it? And so the next thing, well, what happens to these particles in the context of, um, in the context of um, their biological properties once they're administered in vivo, and can you actually design them um, from a surface chemistry perspective, you know, to kind of maximize um, their circulation time, tumor accumulation, et cetera? We had already done that. Previously, um, uh, in, in developing those particles, but we wanted to actually systemically study it. And so, Nicholas Bertrand from Bob Langer's lab, Mursa Mahmoudi from ours, uh, looked at 
um, the um, density of PEG, this was PEG 5000, on the surface of particles of different sizes, so particles that were roughly 50, roughly 100, roughly 150, and they looked at PEG density as a function of number of PEG units, because these are all 5,000 PEGs, uh, per you know, 100 nanometer square surface area. And what they found was that there's a threshold level by which you know, PEG density doesn't actually help or hurt, but below which um, your, you, know, you actually impact PK and clearance goes up faster. Next slide, please. And so if you then look at well, what is driving that, and look at the protein corona that was forming on the surface that is particles with different pegs in vivo, and this should not surprise, they actually had a different protein composition on the surface of these particles, depending on the surface physical chemical properties. So this is, you change the design, chemically, you change the presence of that particle biologically in vivo. And of course, that's going to impact outcome. And so it became obvious to us that we had oversimplified so much in our mind the way we were developing these drugs. By this time, um, it became obvious that as you change around particle physical chemical properties, you're changing the uh, biological identity of those particles. And so while that has a lot of therapeutic value, there's also potential actually in proteomic space. Why? Because if I'm able to change particle physical chemical properties, and I can actually change protein composition on its surface, now the question becomes, can I then design lots and lots of different particles and screen for different ways to sample the proteome. If you look at the biological complexity of the proteome, proteome is very, di uh, very diverse. You go from 20,000 genes, by the time you get to the um, various different differences in the transcription, and then in the translation, and then in the post-translational modification, you go from roughly about 20,000 proteins to a million plus protein variants, and all of those protein variants are going to have different, um, if you would, binding properties in the way they kind of interact with the particle surface. And frankly, protein nanoparticle interaction is no different than the way the rest of the biology and the rest of, you know, biological system interact with each other. Proteins come together because of the physical chemical properties of one protein happens to be a good match for the physical chemical properties of the other protein. Now, in a biological system, you also have a temporal component because this protein happens to have to be also expressed at the same time with this protein. And there is also a location, so they have to be expressed in the same area to kind of be near each other at the same time. But the driver of that binding is their physical chemical properties. Now, if you begin to study proteomics and particles, well, look, physical chemical properties in the world of biology happens by evolution. In the world of engineering and design happens by design and, you know, data science driving you what you learn in terms of binding. And then temporarily, while well, you're exposing them at the same time, and then, you know, the location, you happen to be putting them in the same tube. So we said, you know what, maybe we can design system in an unbiased way to interrogate the proteome deeply without action and what we're looking for, without any of the complexity that goes into a workflow to do deep unbiased proteomic work, like all the fractionation, depletion, and everything. So with that concept, we started a company called SEER, and I'm going to hand it uh, to Seraphim who's going to take you through the rest of the story. Seraphim and Nazila. All right. Um, 
Sorry, just one moment, Seraphim. Thank you, um, Omid. Whilst you're setting up your slide, Seraphim, I'd like to uh, make an introduction. Uh, so yes, Dr. Seraphim Batoglu is Chief of Computation at CIA Bio, uh, leading computational and machine learning research to advance the core proteomics technology and its biomedical applications. Uh, prior to this role, he was Chief Data Officer at in vitro, VP at Illumina, and Professor of Computer Science at Stanford University. He His work has focused on computational genomics and the application of algorithms and AI to diverse problems in biosciences, ranging from genome assembly, comparative genomics, population genetics, cancer genomics, and genome sequencing technologies. He is co-founder of DNA Nexus and has been at several scientific advisory boards, including 23andMe, NextBio, DNA Nexus, Nexus uh, Eve Biomedical, Genapsis, and Molecular. Um, he has also been uh, named among the top young technology innovators by Technology Review magazine. Uh, he has received the inaugural innovation award by the International Society of Computational Biology and has also been named an IC ISCB fellow in 2020. And uh, uh, so today he will be giving uh, the next part of the talk, which is entitled Deep and Scalable Proteomics Through a Transformative Nanoparticle-Based Approach. And after your talk, Seraphim, we will open the, the floor for questions for both yourself and Omid. And with that, uh, very welcome to you. And, and the screen is now yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nazila and the organizers for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here and talk to you about SEER and our technology. Um, as uh, Nazila said, I am a computational biologist, uh, been applying AI to large-scale biomedical data. So I am not a nanoparticles expert, but I've become enamored with nanoparticles, uh, uh, thanks to Omid, and thanks to really their ability to be really tiny little bio labs that collect uh, biomaterial, proteins in this case, which are extremely difficult to sample properly, and lead to the generation of amazing proteomic data. So that's why I am here at SEER. And so let me tell you a little bit about the story. So at SEER, uh, and let me yeah, go to slides, our focus is to address this significant unmet need for unbiased deep proteomics at scale. This is a big mismatch between our ability to interrogate the genome and transcriptome in an unbiased manner which has become possible in the past 20 years due to uh, incredible advances in technologies such as Illumina sequencing technology and others, and our ability to do the same for proteomes, which has to date lagged. Genomics is an excellent indicator of lifetime disease risk, but proteins are dynamic and much more appropriate indicators of the status of cellular, molecular, and even large-scale phenotypes. Virtually every function within a living organism happens because of proteins, groups of proteins that interact and perform functions. Yet, we still haven't been able to scalably measure proteomes in a large patient cohort or in large numbers of biological samples. So we aim to narrow this gap. So there is a big gap in our understanding of the proteome. If you start from the left with the genome and you move to the proteome to the right, there is huge increase in complexity. Starting from the genome, uh, we have about 20,000 regions that are called the 20,000 genes. That is kind of a misnomer. And those re lead to a very, very diverse set of active molecules, the proteins. Um, many variants of a protein can be produced from a single gene during protein synthesis, and after that, proteins are further modified, creating an even greater number of protein variants. Um, let me go to the next slide, a little bit for speed. Uh, proteins uh, basically uh, interact with each other, which has significant impact on health and disease. So we get from 20,000 genes to many, many more uh, ways to splice them together and form uh, hundreds of thousands or more protein splice forms. And then those are further chemically modified to, f to create more and more variation, all of which is important during biological and uh, uh, molecular processes within cells and within organ organisms. So that's what we want to be measuring. 
um, there is um, a number of existing scalable technologies which are so-called targeted, in which, which is to say, they look for a predefined set of proteins and tell whether a given protein is present or absent. These are based on analyte specific reagents or ASRs like antibodies or aptamers that are used to detect the specific protein of interest. ASRs typically bind to a small region of the protein and do not interrogate the entire length of the protein, such as what is the splice form, what is the post-translational modifications or variants of the protein. They are unable to interrogate beta in an amino-specific level of variation that may exist. Now, keep in mind that the average protein is about 470 amino acids long, and the typical ASR binds to an epitope of about five to eight amino acids. Therefore, targeted approaches may not be able to differentiate between protein variants or the protein status, and may even miss given proteins because a variant is right at the epitope binding site. So on the right, to illustrate that, the blue ASR binds to an epitope that is conserved among three different protein variants, and it cannot differentiate between these variants. Conversely, the orange ASR binds to an epitope that is present in the top protein variant, but not available in the other two protein variants. This is either because a post-translational modification has masked the epitope in the middle, or because changes from RNA processing have resulted in the loss of the ASR due epitope during protein synthesis, that's in the bottom. So while targeted approaches can be useful, if you know what you are looking for, they are inherently not equipped as untargeted or unbiased approaches for gaining new biological insight. So existing untargeted approaches are not scalable. This is because in addition to all the complexities of the variants of proteins, proteins also have the complication that they come in a vastly different amount within a given biological sample. There is about 10 orders of magnitude of dynamic range. The top 20 proteins account for about 99% of the, the total protein in the plasma, for instance, and the rest, which account for less than 1%, are actually the ones that make functional differences across the different plasma samples. Therefore, we need to be able to sample proteins across a wide dynamic range. Scientists have addressed this challenge kind of by brute force, by creating a complex workflows that involve depletion of the abundant proteins and fractionation of the remaining proteins and sending them to a mass spectrometer. These complex workflows are not scalable and they are not readily accessible to most labs. We are we think at a significant moment in proteomics, similar to where we were 15 years ago in genomics, where we go from very cumbersome sequencing technologies that in principle work, but they are unscalable to new technologies, such as we believe ours, that really will democratize proteomics. So our approach is based on engineered nanoparticles. That's why we are talking in this conference and that can interrogate the proteins in a biological sample directly mitigating the need for complex workflows. The particles eliminate the complexity and expense and essentially are little uh, labs on a nanoparticle. And we automate our workflow on 96 well-played uh, uh, Hamilton-based instruments. Our approach is highly scalable, reduces the problem of dynamic range, samples the proteins in an untargeted way and is highly automated. And it can be coupled with standard downstream mass spectrometry technology for readout. So here is a few words about our workflow. We have integrated our sample preparation workflow in a Hamilton-based instrument that requires about 30 minutes setup time and then hands-free six hours automated sample preparation. The instrument uses our consumables 
which include reagents and nanoparticles. The prepared samples are injected to any mass spectrometer instrument, and the resulting data are passed to our data analysis QC and uh, uh, higher level analysis and integration with genomic data. As a result, we believe that we are lowering the technology barrier to adopt proteomics for a broader range of small as well as large laboratories. So the previous approaches of, for proteomics that are available today can be divided largely into targeted and untargeted approaches, as I said, and targeted ones. We talked about their um, caveats in not being able to, to sample all the protein variants or being confounded by them. Untargeted approaches are ideally suited for discovery, but to date they are non-scalable, so that's where we think that uh, we are uh, coming in. So, a few words about our technology. Our nanoparticles are designed to solve the protein sampling problem. When a nanoparticle comes in contact with a biological sample, it quickly forms a layer of biomolecules that, as Omid explained, that's the protein corona on the surface. The sampling is selective and highly reproducible for each given nanoparticle design. So if you do use the same nanoparticles in the same biological fluid, you will get highly reproducibly the same data out ultimately. Importantly, the particles not only capture proteins, but they also capture protein-protein interactions and uh, actually other molecules as well. They can, these can occur by capturing proteins that exist at complexes in the biological sample, or once the protein binds to it, proteins with high affinity to it will bind as well and form a secondary level corona. And all of this actually we can take advantage of in downstream data analysis. So, nanoparticle, so basically, uh, during the early stages of the nanoparticle meeting the biological sample, the most abundant proteins bind. Later, due to the Vroman effect, less abundant proteins that have higher affinity to the nanoparticle displace the higher, high abundant proteins and bind to the nanoparticle. This results in actually each nanoparticle, according to its properties, being able to range to, to, sell, to sample many, many proteins in the order of hundreds to a few thousands across the dynamic range. And this is how we partially overcome the, large, the big problem of dynamic range in a sample. But now we can do something more. We can design more than one nanoparticle. We can have a panel of diverse nanoparticles, each of which samples due to its Vroman effect, different proteins across the dynamic range. And this way, we can get a broad and reproducible sampling of the proteome uh, across uh, multiple orders of magnitude of different abundance levels. All right. Uh, sorry, trying to change my slide here. Um, just like the binding between proteins is mediated by spatiotemporal and physiochemical properties of each protein, the binding of proteins to our nanoparticles is mediated by the physiochemical properties of the nanoparticles and the proteins they bind to it. While protein-protein interactions are a function of evolution over millions of years, the binding of proteins to our nanoparticles is driven by a growing body of nanoparticle physiochemical structure protein binding and our data scientists and engineers use it to guide the design of nanoparticles to achieve broad sampling. Our team has made uh, several hundred distinct nanoparticles to date, and the list is constantly growing. And each of these nanoparticles has unique properties that gives it a unique pattern of protein sampling. The physiochemical space that we can tap is almost limitless. And once the team makes a particle, the particle is thoroughly characterized across multiple parameters, and we can remake it with a high degree of reproducibility batch to batch. 
So as I mentioned, I am um, a machine learning expert, uh, computational genomicist. So where do where does machine learning and computational genomics come at CIR? Well, I think it's going to be very important across the technology play chain. So we apply machine learning across a wide span of tasks from the core technology all the way to biomedical insight. At the core technology level, nanoparticles of different physiochemical properties have affinity to different types of proteins, and these can in principle be modeled with machine learning. So we are building such predictive binding models, and we plan to use them to design nanoparticles and panels of nanoparticles optimized for broad proteome coverage or later even for selective enrichment of specific types of proteins and post-translational modifications. There is a rich set of problems in secondary analysis. In genomics, the goal of secondary analysis is to catalog the genomic variants present in an individual's genome or the levels of mRNA expression of every gene in every given sample. In proteomics, the goal of secondary analysis is to measure the level of abundance of peptide variants, proteins, alternative splice forms, PTMs, and protein interactions present in a given proteome and connect those to the genomics. At the other end of the spectrum, proteomes are highly dynamic and more variable than transcriptomes, and machine learning will be key in integrating proteomic data with genomic, metabolomic, and multiomic data and phenotypic data and to enable large cohort studies and longitudinal studies. So in the rest of the talk, and I will be brief, I will give, a, I will describe a few studies that we performed using our technology, and I will discuss uh, very briefly some ideas about how we apply machine learning across the technology chain. So, um, I, uh, moving to the next slide, sorry about the, oops. Uh, have some luck here. Or in a paper we just submitted, we examined the physiochemical properties and surface functionalizations of nanoparticles. These in those include many things such as charge, polymer, sugar, aromatic systems, phosphates, amines, hydrophobicity, hydroxyl groups, and so more, much more. Unsurprisingly, we found that proteins and protein classes are differentially attracted to nanoparticles as a function, predictable function of those properties. So at the plot to the right, you can see a simple hierarchical clustering of 37 nanoparticles that the, the, those are the rows of the matrix, according to their enrichment shown in red or depletion shown in blue of different protein categories as grouped by uniprot keywords. And don't worry about what this is, it's basically functional uh, keywords on protein categories. So we observed clustering both of nanoparticles and of protein types, showing that different protein classes are attracted to different surface properties. And based on these properties, we designed a five nanoparticle panel to maximize the overall proteome coverage within plasma. And this is just our first panel. Many more and better ones will follow. So this analysis was simple. Nanoparticles were modeled as a list of physiochemical features, and proteins were grouped simply by their uniprot keywords. More elaborate models of protein sequence and structure, such as the recent graph neural networks based models, uh, one of them is called Massive, uh, of protein surfaces, are going to perform much better with sufficient data. We plan to develop deep learning models of protein sequence and structure as well as nanoparticles and design properties of nanoparticles and panels based on these models. In principle, we will leverage these models to broaden our coverage of the proteome, reduce volume requirements and requirements, and maybe even to target specific protein classes of interest or post-translational modifications. So here's a recent study that we performed using our platform published in Nature Communications. We presented the data on performance in profiling the proteome as well as application in classifying early stage lung cancer. So this was a study on 141 samples from 
61 patients with no non-small cell lung carcinoma, that's a mouthful, or we call it NSCLC, and 80 controls. So we classified early stage NSCLC versus healthy controls using a simple decision tree, and we got some reasonable performance with AUC of 0.91 and detection of about 60% of the patients with perfect specificity. This is a very small study. So the results are really promising that the plasma proteome has useful information for the classification and detection of cancer. And interestingly, among the features that the classifier selected was the protein tubulin, a component of the cytoskeleton and an intercellular protein found in platelets, also a target for the chemotherapeutic drug Paxilaxel and a biomarker for neuronal tissue damage in cerebrospinal fluid. So there is many approaches today for NGS-based liquid biopsy for cancer detection. We think that including proteomic data can potentially significantly enhance liquid biopsy methods for cancer and many other diagnostic applications. So a few words on the technical performance of our workflow in terms of proteome coverage. We confidently detected 1,664 protein groups on average per sample. We detected 2,500 proteins across all the samples and about 2,000 proteins in at least one quarter of the samples. We compare our coverage to the standard mass spectrometry approach for plasma proteomics, which is to use depletion, in this case the Mars depletion column, to get rid of the 12 most abundant proteins in the sample. We perform much better, as you can see in this plot, with four times more proteins detected per sample. So let's take a quick a closer look at the performance. We confirm that, we com that proteins detected across all dynamic range between our fi uh, five nanoparticle panel. And three conventional approaches uh, are compared here, including analysis of D-need plasma, depletion, and the traditional D-plasma proteomics, quote-unquote, fractionation protocol. So as we see, our method is significantly better in coverage. You can see that we sample across the dynamic range, and we are able to pick many more low abundance proteins. We also measure precision by coefficient of variation of peptide abundances or CV percentage, our method is more accurate than fractionation depletion, and it has slightly lower CV than NEAT plasma, but this is because in NEAT plasma, accuracy is dominated by performance in the handful of proteins that are most abundant. There are other approaches for getting deeper in the plasma proteome, such as elaborate depletion following by deep fractionation uh, and long MS gradients. However, those are much more laborious, so our method is highly scalable and we process the samples in a, in a bit more, all of the samples together, in a bit more than two weeks using a very modest lab resource. So in the following plot here, you see a uh, dynamic range. Um, we plot intensity as measured by the proteograph against the measured protein levels in a reference database. The left column is neat plasma and the three colored plots are three different nanoparticles. As you can see, on a log scale, the protein dynamic range is effectively compressed by about half, and that's why we can get to deeper proteome. All right, so moving on to secondary analysis. Here, our goal is to detect not just proteins, but protein variants. And to do so, detection has to be focused on the peptide level instead of the whole protein level. Variants come in many, many forms. The simplest are amino acid variants, which are generally already known from genome or exome data. Here, ideally, we want to quantify differential abundance of alleles of each protein within a cohort and figuring out that if this variant is expressed more, let's say, it leads to more, you know, it's correlated with disease or this variant is more protective. 
Even more interesting are different splice forms and post-translational modifications. Splice forms are different ways in which the same genome sequence can be spliced together to form different versions of the protein sequence and the resulting protein structure. A function of this a splice for the, the function of these splice forms can be vastly, vastly different across the different forms. You really have many, many proteins essentially from the same gene. Uh, currently, our workflow detects a median of eight peptides per protein, and we plan to increase this. So, with many peptides per protein, we have some ability to tell and to quantify between the different splice forms of a protein. So our method is based on mass spectrometry for measurement, as I said. This allows us to measure individual peptides and to detect protein variants. Targeted methods uh, have this caveat that they cannot do that. We can, in principle, detect protein variants that are rare or private to an individual. In our NSCLC study, looking at 29 individuals, for which we also had genomic data, the fraction of variants for any given allele frequency that we detected, shown in green, matched the fraction of the population in the population of that allele frequency. So basically, we are not biased to rare or common variants. We sample across the whole range. And rare variants are very important because in the population, rare variants vastly outnumber common variants. And rare variants are highly enriched for pathogenicity. Common variants are known to usually be either benign or to have a small effect in disease. Rare variants are much more likely to be deleterious and to have a large effect in common and rare disease. It is possible that rare protein forms, like splice forms and aberrant protein modifications, may also play an increased role in aberrant phenotypes and disease. And that's where an untargeted approach is needed, like ours. So the number of rare variants, to give you just, just a brief idea, at the genome level is vast. There was a recent study of last year, NOMAD exome study of total of uh, 130,000 individuals whose exomes were sequenced. There were 4.5 million amino acid variants within NOMAD, of which more than half were unique to a single individual. And there were a full 443,000 variants in the proteins that were called high confidence protein losses of function, so completely killing the protein, disrupting the function of 16,700 genes. And all of these are things that we need to be able to catalog and their activity in principle within the proteome, not just within the genome. All right. So in our roadmap here, we view machine learning as key enabling to detect protein variants at the basic level of peptides, um, at the uh, higher level of splice forms and post-translational modification. Also, I want to mention that recently there has been a proliferation of new methods using deep learning in mass spectrometry. Spectro spectrogram images are a suitable data type for deep learning because in spectrograms, peptides generate a specific pattern in the mass over charge over retention time plots obtained by the instrument. And those look like images uh, and they have very, very intricate patterns that can be detected by deep learning. And to date, about 70% of the spectrogram data are so-called dark matter that are left unidentified. And a significant fraction of such data may hold peptide variants and other interesting molecules that can be identified in the future. So um, I want to mention also that our technology can, in principle, detect protein interactions. And in the future, we will develop more and more towards that end. Protein complexes that are transient or tissue specific can in principle be observed through the differential co-occurrence of pairs of proteins across different nanoparticles. Again, we have not developed all these methods, but we are now starting to develop our machine learning capability. And we expect that us, as well as many other groups, 
will make a lot of progress in this area in the next few years and facilitate adoption of proteomics by the genomics and biomedical community. Here is one example of different, e differently expressed protein isoforms or splice forms in a cancer study. Basically, we observe that bone morphogenic protein 1 comes in four different splice forms, two long forms and two short forms. And interestingly, the short forms are more common in cancer patients and the long forms are more common, I mean, more abundant, I want to say, in controls. Another example study is an Alzheimer's and mild cognitive impaired study we did on 200 samples and controls. We detected 2,085 proteins in at least a quarter of the 200 samples and matched them to the human plasma proteome database of 3,500 proteins. These detected proteins included 27 proteins relevant to Alzheimer's disease, according to their high so-called open target 2 association scores. The proteins that we detected extended through more than eight orders of magnitude of dynamic range, as you can see in this plot. And I'm going to go fast. I finally want to say a few words about how we will put it all together in the medium term. To date, genomicists, bioinformaticians, and machine learning people have been working with genomic, epigenomic, and transcriptomic data. This has been driven by the dramatic reduction in cost and increase in throughput of DNA sequencing technologies, and this has led to tremendous insight. However, DNA and RNA are only one big class of molecules that are connected to a cellular and organismal phenotypes and to disease. There are many more types of molecules. Proteins are arguably the most important class, being the predominant product of the genome. Proteoforms, post-translational modification, protein structures, complexes, signaling cascades are increasingly complex molecules with increasingly dynamic responses. And are, and are much more directly connected to cellular and organismal phenotypes. Also, small molecules, metabolites and lipids, are even more dynamic and are both endogenous and exogenous. More moving from genomics to multiomics will e eventually be necessary to fully revolutionize diagnosis and treatment of disease and to design personalized drugs and therapies. From a computational perspective, how can we accomplish all that? And I will take only two more minutes. As a first approximation, we want to enable proteomics and multiomics on a, of a large cohort and to translate the methodologies developed for population genomics to the proteomic and to the multiomic longitudinal domain. In particular, consider three broad methodologies that genomicists have developed over the past 20, 30 years. Genome-wide association studies polygenic risk scores, and rare variant burden tests. And you may have heard of those. They are even popularized in the press. Similar to genome-wide association studies, multiomic association studies and proteomic association studies can be performed between the presence, absence, or direction of change of any molecular variant or molecular pathway to a given phenotype or disease. Similar to polygenic risk scores that tell you how, how much risk one may have for a given disease based on their whole profile of the genotype or genome, and those are integrated with regression or machine learning, multiomic and proteomic risk scores can be developed, hopefully much more accurate, using machine learning to predict and monitor health and disease. Multiomic risk scores could be, and, poly, and proteomic risk scores could be much more actionable because they can be taken every day because of the dynamic changes and give fresh information of how one's health is going. And then, similar to rare variant burden tests in genomics that are the gold standard for finding effective draggable targets, building proteomic and multiomic burden tests, finding genes, proteins, and pathways that are burdened with rare, likely deleterious variants in patients versus a control, can give us a very clear idea of which 
proteins and which pathways drugs should target. So at CIR, we want to help enable such studies by developing both the technology for accurate and scalable proteomics and multiomics and the machine learning methods to help enable the community make sense of the data. So I'm gonna finish here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, if we have time, I'm, Omid and I are happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Seraphim, for a really amazing talk. Uh, that was fantastic insight into what nanoparticles can do for proteomics and, and disease detection. And of course, I think uh, the first time I hear lab on a nanoparticle, and, and that's a really, really exciting um, and, and just opens up so much more. Um, yes, thank you so much uh, to also to Omid. So um, we will now open the floor for questions directed at both of you. Um, and thanks very much also to the audience for hanging on so far uh, this late into the evening here in London. Um, please, uh, are there any questions for Omid or Seraphim at this stage? Yes, Yuval, I see your hand raised. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, do you think your approach can ever be extended to single cell analysis or single cell proteomics? Is that within the realms of possibility, do you think? That's a, uh, Omid, please. No, okay. no, no, Sarafan, please, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah, from my perspective, um, you all, thank you for the question. This is a fantastic question. Uh, in principle, yes. However, I also want to say that we are solving one challenge here, which is deep, broad coverage of the proteome in samples with vast dynamic range. And that is kind of a different problem from dealing with a ridiculously low volume and being able to specifically tell between different proteomes in different cells, uh, over which uh, basically I think solving one problem at a time makes sense and combining them as well. So I think in the future, but uh, there is still a bit of work to be done in uh, the ability to actually sample proteomes in large samples. Uh, I guess I, I also had a question, and, and forgive me if this goes down a chemistry kind of route, but uh, uh, in terms of thinking about the surface, the differential surface of your um, nanoparticles and how chemistry is really enabling that by using different functional groups, presumably um, with, uh, you know, bulky structures versus uh, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, differently charged structures and so on. Um, can you provide, or does your AI um, intel uh, intelligence provide, you know, point towards any type of um, specific uh, chemical bonding that, that that comes out of this story in terms of, you know, uh, is binding uh, dominated by electrostatics or is it by sterics? Um, what, what, what could you tell us there in terms of what really is the fundamental um, sort of physical chemistry at play here? At the first level, electrostatics are very important. We are looking at different particle uh, surface functionalizations, which are also very important. And uh, ultimately, to get to the sterics, I think that will require some additional data gathering to be able to properly uh, to, to properly model the protein steric surface and correlate that with the results. So what I'm saying is that the the first order of results with limited data or medium amount of data will be on the functionalizations and the chemical properties, and then the sterics will come once we get lots more data. Mm -hmm. Um, and in terms of like the, uh, you mentioned primary and secondary protein coronas or the soft or the hard, which is kind of what the field is more, more um, familiar with. Um, how uh, do you really see, um, you know, of course, uh, there is a difference here and, 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 the, and the way proteins behave between these two layers are, are quite important. Um, is this, you know, does this relationship um, show up um, in, in terms of your diagnosis as well? Uh, or, you know, you're not really too bothered about the soft corona and it's more about the hard corona. And, 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 and are you seeing insights into this relationship much um, 
from in vivo samples? As if at the first level, um, there is no distinction of what level of the corona is in the sample. We care to sample the proteins in the sample and to, think, and to catalog them. Now, if we're going to go to the next level and actually catalog protein interactions and figure out which ones bind primarily and which ones bind to other proteins, that uh, can be done given sufficient data for those complexes that are transient so that you can have in similar samples the complex to be both present and absent so as to see the difference and to detect it with machine learning, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. And and I, I might ask a few more questions, if I may, if 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 um if there are none from the audience. So you know, as nanomedicine researchers, um, we've had fantastic talks today. Um, I think these talks will be on YouTube if you would like to um, uh, uh, look at them uh, ahead of time. Uh, from now, I appreciate your times as a different. We had talks about how trivalent bond, um, um, trivalent. Uh, uh, ligand uh, functionalities are quite important um, in terms of binding and, and, and binding affinities and so on. And, you know, there's such a huge body of work um, uh, spent on developing targeting and ligands and, and homing particles to speci specific parts of the body. Uh, but your work is really saying that, you know, actually a nanoparticle is like a lab where, you know, you, ha you have so many different bells and whistles and, and this determines, you know, the binding to very, very specific population of proteins, including this sort of 1%, which, which, which is, which is um, you know, the sort of functional proteins you, you alluded to. So, so where does that leave us? You know, does, does is targeting hampered <laughs> by the protein corona? Should, should, you know, this now be put into every protocol or, you know, uh, put into every aim of a grant that, you know, we really do need to study the protein corona and, and, and whether this kind of completely... Um, swamps <laughs> ligand-based approaches. Nazila, maybe I'll take a crack at that. Um, <clears throat> so look, it's a topic near and dear to my heart and um, because we have developed targeted approaches, brought them to the clinic. Um, we've developed targeted approaches, developed vaccines out of them. And the question is, if you do that and then the protein corona covers everything, you know, what's the purpose of it? Um, so I, I don't, this is not what we're saying, um, uh, but, the, but the point we're raising is that um, it's a lot more complex than the schematic that you put in a paper would reflect would, what would happen. Um, in fact, the regulatory agencies in U.S., and I don't know about U.K., uh, the FDA now suggests for uh, nanoparticle therapeutics to actually look at the protein corona uh, as part of the, um, uh, the analysis that you do in your chemistry manufacturing and control package uh, that goes to support a clinical study. So they, they do want to see that. Um, and because presumably those may be different across patients, and that might actually guide you in patient selection and therapy selection, et cetera. Um, certainly, we've seen that uh, targeting approaches do work. So whatever protein composition is forming on the surface, really changing that surface from what is synthetically made in a lab uh, to what the body sees in vivo, those ligands still has impact. Now, if it's part of your design, then maybe the the linker length maybe need to be different. Maybe the choice of the ligand needs to be different. And I don't think it's going to be a one uh, answer that fits all questions dynamic. And we just have to look at these on a case by case basis. I think, you know, maybe transparent targeting is very different than a small molecule folate targeting. And so I think we need to look at these on a case by case basis, on a material by material basis, to look at the corona on the surface and actually see what is it that is exposed on the surface. And frankly, um, you know, we're going to see increasingly. Um, uh, 
investigators understanding that complexity and bringing other dimension into the equation, like shape, like other things that today is not a big part of our analysis. So Nazila, I do think that we're in a very sharp part of the slope in our understanding. And what's beautiful is that as data gets accumulated, you now have the tools to have AI and machine learning guide design. We just haven't had that yet. And so there is actually uh, a, a follow-on paper that SEER is going to be um, um, publishing that's looking at changes on the surface and that, for example, selectivity or deselection of certain set of proteins, and then actually looking at which functional groups are driving what kind of chemical interactions. But, but the thing is, that paper is honing on just a, a handful of proteins, but that particle is actually sampling hundreds of proteins, which argues to the complexity involved, right? But we're just getting started, uh, uh, Nazila, and I expect as the body of data grows, um, our level of understanding is going to grow at this incredible slope uh, and incredible velocity. So, Fantastic. Thank you very much, Omid. That's really inspirational. Um, I, I guess we have, in the interest of time, uh, uh, time for one or two questions. We have one question from an audience member. Uh, Hoi Jin asks, do you think it would be possible to take CS technologies to simulate me mechanisms of medication for neurogenesis, neurogenesis in the near future? Look, I, I would say that um, if you think of what proteins do, which is virtually every functional thing that your body does, then understanding what happens at the protein level in a cell, in the tissue, is very informative. Um, we've seen when you get large-scale access to, to analytes uh, classes like genomics at large scale, I mean, today we've sequenced a million genome, we've sequenced 10 million exomes. There's so much that we understand um, that it can drive new insights, um, understanding new mechanisms, and so now you add not just genomic information, but really functional context. You begin to annotate that genomic information in terms of function. And I think it's actually quite powerful. I think there are applications where proteomics will have an impact that actually genomic can't. And my prediction is just about everything that genomic has touched, proteomics will touch, plus areas that proteomics will touch that genomic can't. Like if I look at neurodegenerative diseases, um, unlike cancer early detection, when you look at diseases like Alzheimer's, there really isn't a very good underpinning at the genomic level that you could understand of who gets it and why and when. But in every one of those cases, as that disease is progressing, your proteomic signature is changing. And so in that context and that example, a proteomic content will have much more utility than, say, genomic information. But I do think that if you're a data scientist, a seraphinist, you actually don't pick and choose. You want to have as much information as possible. So you have, you throw genomics, you throw transcriptomics, you throw proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomic. The aggregated collection of data is far more informative than any one class of uh, uh, analyte alone. And the thing is, because of innovation that happened in NGS, we did get access to large-scale unbiased genomic content. We have not been able to do unbiased, deep unbiased proteomic at the same scale. What got enabled in the context of what my colleagues at SEER developed uh, is that for the first time, you can get to deep unbiased proteomic at scale and impedance match by which our access to genomic is today to our access in proteomics. Fantastic. Um, yes, I think that are there any other questions from the audience? And last but final, presumably you can also detect SARS-CoV-2. 
Bila, we, we, you know, we, we have done very, very little work with some colleagues at the NIH um, and um, specifically looking at proteomic signatures of patients with infection or not, but not looking at the, uh, at the uh, capsid proteins. And in those cases, uh, you know, the studies were small, but we do see some changes at the proteomic level with prior or, or post-infection. Fantastic. Um, well, with that being said, on behalf of my organization, um, organizing colleagues, um, really thanks uh, to, to the keynote speakers and, of course, all our speakers today across all three sessions. It's been a really fantastic um, afternoon, and, and, and I hope that everyone's enjoyed themselves and, and is going to take something away from this. Um, thank you very much for your time. Sorry, we're about sort of 15 minutes or so over, but um, thanks a lot and enjoy your evening and, uh, and mornings and afternoon in the U.S. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you, Nadila. Be well, be safe, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.